We are back. We're back. And talking about a very interesting topic, which is Egypt again, and yeah. ancient Egypt. But today we're going to talk about the Great Sphinx in Giza. It's amazing. <clears throat> so you've been a big fan of looking into the Sphinx and all the mysteries behind it. What can you tell us about it? What is the Sphinx? Well, the Sphinx is um, the body of a lion, okay? And, and the way it stands today is with the, uh, the head of a pharaoh carved onto that body of the lion. But it's brought about a lot of controversy because, you know, it's not, the head is not proportional to the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. And that's easily seen um, from pictures and as you stand in front of it and so forth. Yeah. And so it's a tremendous amount of controversy along with, um, I mean, we'll be debating it forever unless we find something that states who actually carved it, the Hall of Records or something like this, the Emerald Tablets or something like this. So it's, um, you know, everybody's continuously talking about it. Um, but what is uh, so special about the Sphinx that there's so much mystery behind it? I mean, the pyramids are amazing, but why is the Sphinx, it's a big structure. It's a huge structure. Um, I think it's, um, I want to say, I think it's 150 feet long or something like that. And about four stories high, something like that. The f it's huge, okay? However, compared to the Great Pyramid, when you take a picture of the entire Giza Plateau, it seems small mm -hmm. compared to the Big Pyramid, you know? Yeah. And... Um, there's also a Sphinx enclosure, okay? And the Temple of the Sphinx, Sphinx right in front, too. And uh, it's just an amazing sight altogether. And then, um, you know, over the years, there's been a lot of controversy also on how old it is, just like the pyramids. The thing that um, there was a guy named John Anthony West that... Um, was reading some older books about Egypt. And in those older books, uh, they made a reference to water erosion to the Sphinx. And so he ended up looking for some people with an open mind so that they could take a look at it. And he tricked one gentleman, uh, Robert Schock, uh, if what he told him is, look, um, he took a picture of the Sphinx. He, he brought him to Egypt, I think, in the 90s. And uh, I think that the way he brought him to Egypt is that they met somewhere earlier on. Um, and, and I'm not quite sure of this, okay? I'm sure of what I'm going to tell you now. I just don't know when the meeting took place, if it mm -hmm. was when Robert Schock went to Egypt first before looking at the Sphinx. But what, what John Anthony West did was he took a picture of the Sphinx and then he covered the front portion of it so that it would be just the body of the Sphinx, but it looks like maybe a mountain range or something when you cover the face, okay? Mm -hmm. And showed it to Robert Schock, who is a geologist that uh, I think he graduated from... Yale. Yale University. Yeah, PhD. PhD, you know, uh, very well studied man. Yeah. And he says, well, what do you think this is? Who could have, what could have caused this erosion? And Robert Schock looked at it and said, oh, without a doubt, without a doubt, that's water erosion. And John Anthony West said, you sure about that? And he goes, oh yeah, without a doubt. And then John Anthony West took off the cover for the front and, show, and then show him the entire picture. And Robert Schock, according to... Was what, shocked. Yeah, he said, uh, oh. He said, oh. That's a... You know, because that was a problem. Right. Because, um, you know, they were claiming that it was just a, a few thousand years old. But if it had gone water erosion to that extent that it had, you know, created those grooves, then at that point in time... It made it much, much 
older because there wasn't water in Egypt for 10,000 years prior. So you had to turn the clock back God. thousands of years. Yeah, yeah. And it's very interesting the way the story goes, you know? Yeah. And so um, do they know, like, what it was built for? Was it a tribute to somebody uh, or why it was built? I mean, I looked up what a sphinx was, right? And, and in Greek mythology, it had wings. Uh -huh. It was like the lion. But I know in Egypt, it was a different version. But um, w was it there to like guard the pyramids? Or do they know this? Or we really don't know. I'll tell you what. I think that I have read over the years, there's uh, top-notch people out there. Um, you know, Hancock is, uh, Graham Hancock is tremendous. And there's another Robert guy. Schock has dedicated, I think, his whole career to a lot of the it. Sphinx. Yeah, well, Anthony West brought him out, and since then he created all kinds of issues to himself, because Robert Schock is a geologist, and uh, I like this saying that I repeat a lot. You know, the rocks don't lie. Mm -hmm. The rocks don't lie. You can study the rocks, and the rocks will tell you the true picture. Okay. And it was covered under sand, right? Correct. So it's only till what the er is it the early 1900s that it was actually exposed. Yeah, there was um, a guy named Salim Hassam, which was an archaeologist, Egyptologist in in Egypt, and he finally did it complete. It was a gargantuan type of effort in the late 1930s. In the 30s, okay. Yeah. There was another guy named Giovanni Caviglia that tried to do it, and he had, uh, rumor has it that he had about 160 men at his disposal, um, but they were doing it incorrectly. The sand was caving in as fast as they were taking it out, mm. it did, you know. And, uh, and this gentleman, Salim Hassam, I think that the way he did it was he built wooden structures to be able to hold back some of it, and kept taking thing, you know, sand out. He he completed the task, but it was a tremendous thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what you know, I've been re I've read a bunch of stuff on this, and so sometimes you you just don't know who to believe anymore because a lot of it is conjecture. But I'll tell you what I think. I think it was uh, uh, a female lion, a lioness. And um, it was facing the constellation of Taurus. Excuse me. Leo. Of right? Leo. Yeah. The constellation of Leo, the lion. The lion, yeah. And, um, you know, Graham Hancock and this other guy named Robert Gubal uh, have this theory that you can take now with computer... Uh, uh, you know, yeah, you, a program. Programs, you can go back to when the time of the uh, constellation of Leo was facing. I think it's due north where the Sphinx is looking, and uh, it goes back like twelve thousand five hundred years or something like that. And so it, um, and they have this thing. I forgot the name of the book, but it's it's uh, they get um, they have a theory that the pyramids, the three pyramids, are not completely aligned exactly. They're off-center. One of them is off-center. And they're saying that that um, is um, the constellation. It, it reflects the constellation of Orion in the sky. Mm -hmm. And then when they talk about Orion, that was the most important constellation in all of Egyptian history. They talk about it in reverence as if it were uh, a god, the constellation of Orion. And so they, as you used a computer program and you backdate to that uh, format and constellation, even the River Nile falls into place to show the our galaxy. Hmm. So... Um, uh, Graham Hanka explains uh, very vividly that he doesn't believe that nobody could have put the River Nile there, but they used the River Nile to reflect our galaxy 
and then they built the pyramids to reflect the constellation of Orion. And, and there's a very famous saying throughout history, ancient history, us above, so below. And so they make reference to uh, people that, you know, potentially had come from other planets, inhabited the earth, and helped spread, you know, this knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a devastating, um, chaotic time on earth. We were hit by an asteroid or, yeah. you know, and um, a, a cataclysm occurred. Um, and so, I, I mean, the well, entire history of it is extremely, extremely interesting. Oh, yeah. And uh, especially if the people that who built it were able to align with the stars and, you know, understand, you know, the constellations and all that. That's, that's why there's a lot of, because what we're sharing here about like, um, do, is it uh, Dr. West? I don't know if he was a doctor. Uh, Anthony West. Anthony West. And he Dr. was an Shock. independent Egyptologist. Okay. He got a lot of. Well, they were not, they're not seen as the conventional view of the right. Sphinx. The conventional view, so that we're clear on it, is that it was built or attributed to the Pharaoh, Pharaoh Khufu. Khufu. And, and there's a piece of the beard that they have found. They found it at the paw of the Sphinx. So at one point in time, it was a Pharaoh. At least the, there's a beard. Right, but I think that that was... Um, carved later on. Okay. Okay. Because it's uh, smaller and it's yes. Well, the the face the the head is disproportionately small compared to the rest of the body. No doubt about it. Got it. So you're saying before it was carved down or or whatever happened to it where it was eroded, then they put yeah. afterwards they put they the wanted pharaoh. to uh, honor the pharaoh and so they carved his head into it. Hmm. Um. So yeah. they even, mm, there is a, I'm not sure if this gentleman is a forensic sci a scientist, but they brought somebody from the New York Police Department. They flew him out to Egypt. His expertise was to be able to uh, uh, do drawings of faces based on descriptions and... Um, oh, okay. Okay, and based, I think, also on muscle mass. So they flew this gentleman from New York City. He was a, I'm going to say forensic scientist, but I'm not sure. And they flew him to Egypt so that he could do the study. This was the man's expertise. And he um, did measurements of the face, uh, mandibular angles, uh, very mathematical uh, type of investigation. And he concluded that... Um, the, the face was way too small for the rest of the body and that uh, it was it was it had been recarved. He couldn't tell you what it was before. Right. Okay. But he definitely said, look, th these features we can tell that they were like added on thereafter. Mm. And that was the guy's expertise. And he worked for the New York Police Department. Yeah. I forgot the guy's name. Um I hate, I think his first name was Tony, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Um, and so uh, it, it's just extremely interested, interesting. You know, they say that the entire Giza Plateau is kind of like a, a viewing for interplanetary, uh, you know, um, sections like equinoxes and, and so forth and so on. So um, they were done with precise mathematical knowledge of our stars okay and our planets and um, it definitely not done by people with uh, rudimentary uh, tools you know yeah a hammer and a chisel they, they, it could not have been it could not have been plus That's... there's all kinds of secrets associated with the sphinx they say that under its left paw okay there is a space there quite mm -hmm. big enough and and history alludes to the fact that the you know the hall of records the histories of mankind lies there and you know time and time again they have stopped 
the investigation of things. You can just get a probe in there, and and time and time again they've stopped it. Yeah. And um, well, one thing that was interesting in doing some of the preparation to to talk about the Sphinx, because. My understanding is just basic what we learned, you know, in school, let's say, and then having some sort of interest in it, and you brought it up. But um, Dr. Uh, Shock, Robert mm -hmm. Shock, he says that he did a seismic testing, and they that's where they found a cavity that looked to be artificially made or artificial that is in the left paw. But yeah, like you're saying, it hasn't been... Um, excavated or they haven't looked into it and there are shafts another uh, thing the body of the sphinx and there's one that goes i think through the midline and then there's a portion that goes up and another portion that goes down mm. and recently there's been these new young uh, truth seekers mm -hmm. let's say that they're trying to get you know to the uh, bottom of it. To the bottom of it. And there's been some very interesting pictures that have come out. And, um, <laughs> you know, this guy, Mr. Hawass, uh, uh, says there's nothing to it, but yet they don't show us the shafts and where the channels go through and why can't they just point, you know, a camera or something towards it. He j he, we just have to take his word for it. And yeah. um, he's been linked with a couple of interesting things uh, things out there that you know, you know, we we maybe shouldn't take his word on it. We should do the the. He's the know. one that controls everything. He in did. That he Egyptian. did. Egyptian. He did. He no longer has that post, but I believe that he has tremendous power. And you know, in reality, this man has been around. I think in the spotlight for forty years or so, and he's been in control of a lot of the Egyptian. Uh, discoveries and you know he's like the top-notch uh, Egyptologist of yeah. all times right so he to, to give him some credit he you know he's put out a lot of information to the world yeah but many people believe that he's also been a hinder uh, to the progress uh, a lot and so uh, you yeah. know, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that because this is history of the world, not just of Egypt. It's the history of the world. Now, having said that, and having read quite a bit of it, in the old days, when they would discover something, they would take it, whoever it was, whether it was the English or the French or whatever, and they would take it from Egypt. So... You know, it's the, it's the typical story that the pendulum swings all the way back. Now you can't, you know, even during the history of Howard Carter, uh, that he discovered the tomb of Tutankhamen, uh, there's, you know, prior to it, there was a, um, prior to this discovery, there was a um, contract, so to speak, in place where you would share in the spoils of, discovery 50 50 with the antiquity society of of egypt well uh six weeks prior to the discovery of king tut that was completely changed <laughs> and they didn't allow uh, anything to 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 get out interesting it, something of this nature you you folks can can check this out but i came across some readings in this and so what ends up happening is that the the treasures were abused, yeah. and the treasures continue to be abused. the uh, The underground market, the black market, for Egyptian antiquities, it's a billion dollar market. Crazy billion with a B like boy. I mean, they're priceless. Artifacts. They are priceless. They are priceless. Artifacts, yeah. And there is an old saying that. If you're near, I forget the name of the uh, the city, but it's near Giza. It's, it's near the anywhere in Egypt. You get a shovel, okay? Anywhere in Egypt, you get a shovel and you start digging, and you go beyond three feet down, and you're bound to get something. You're bound to find something. 
Yeah. They're finding things constantly. Yeah. That's constantly. what's crazy is that they're still, like recently you said they found something in the, was it the Great Pyramid? Yeah. They found a, a, another chamber? Or what? Another chamber. Yeah. And also there were tunnels that were discovered, right, uh, that lead to the pyramids? <laughs> yeah. I think in 2019 I, I read something about yeah, that. Yeah, and, and this uh, archaeologist from uh, the Dominican Republic, her last name is Martinez, she is at the edge of, she potentially will have the biggest discovery of this century if indeed she's finding the tomb of Cleopatra. <laughs> so nobody has ever found the tomb of Cleopatra, and she believes that she's got it. And she's found uh, artifacts that are extremely exciting to that point. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's still going on. It's still going on. And, you know, I mean, it's all the Middle East. But really, if you take a look at the entire world, you know, here in the United States, there's a lot of unexplained things. There are walls and all kinds of mounds and oh yeah you could research so they're we, saying that the egyptians reached uh the grand canyon <laughs> yeah, i mean the, that there's a cave in the grand canyon about a thousand feet down extremely hard to get to that this man named king k discovered it because i uh, the president made the grand canyon a uh, natural Na national yeah, monument yeah, and so you could not travel freely, and so he ended up, before it became a, a national treasure, he he traveled, and then he found this thing, and they got the Smithsonian Institute, and unfortunately, the Smithsonian Institute has a very bad rap. Mm. They're hiding, you know, they get they send people out, and then they take all the the the, the proof the that's been you know, excavated and then it disappears. And so uh, somebody's trying to hide something. That's one of the things that... And that's how conspiracy theories are born. Yeah, yeah, because people want to know and people, like, when you hear the the conventional... Uh, the conventional story of the, the Sphinx, mm -hmm. it just doesn't sound right. No. It just seems like it's off. It's saying that... What it's somewhere between uh, five thousand years old, six thousand years old, something like four, that, right? No, four thousand years old, four or five thousand years old, and um, the and it's one of the things that I thought was interesting is that it's not there's the it's not written anywhere about it, right? In terms of like who built it, no. And usually they the Egyptians apparently were very documented yes, a lot of things. the dynastic Egyptians uh, documented everything. And there's nothing there about the pyramids nor the Sphinx. There is a... Um, there's something about... I don't know if it's a stela or it's on one of the walls of the monuments, but they're, they're, they're talking about renovating or fixing up a certain portion of the pyramid. Hmm. And a lot of people say, okay, see, there it is. This is when they built it. But they weren't talking about building it. They were talking about preventing further damage. Uh, as far as, you know, I understand it. Mm -hmm. Look, it's... you. I've read so much on this. And it, it, you come for... The, John Anthony West, before he passed, okay... Uh, he created this controversy. He didn't. He discovered this. Okay, he brought this to light. Mm -hmm. He didn't create it. The Sphinx was there, but he brought this to light to contest the normal thought of conventional, let's say, archaeology. Right. Yeah. So some people believe that, you know, we can go back with the Sphinx like fifteen thousand years. 12,000 years, <laughs> but there was a point in time before Anthony was passed that he, he made a comment, the Sphinx could be 36,000 years old. <laughs> in other words, the constellations come back, right? Right. On, on a regular basis, like uh, X number of years on their cycle, okay? And I'm not an expert in any of this, so, you know, I do this for fun, and this is to stimulate the minds of people. But you can get back to the cycle of 
uh, the constellation of Leo, you go one more trip around. The only thing is that it's another 15,000 years. Yeah. Okay? And, wow. and, you know, everything is linked to the precession of the equinoxes, which um, a lot of people, thought, scientists thought, okay, the precession of the equinoxes was just discovered like 2,000 years ago. But the ancients had a really, really good handle on it. And you're talking about the Great Year, which is a 26,000-year cycle, mm. okay, which changes. If you look into the horizon and you move your finger one, that's one degree. And that one degree, for it to move in this cycle, it would take 72 years, which means they had to study that cycle, and they were aware of it. Wow. And so <clears throat> there's just a lot of, the more you learn, mm -hmm. okay, the more questions. The more that, you question. <laughs> and that's the beauty of it. And yeah. That's why I keep reading and, you know, yeah. one day potentially we will find an answer. Yeah. Well. One day. You can't. Um, Somebody knows, okay. Somebody discovered something and they're keeping it in their private uh, collections. This is what I believe. Okay? Now, you, Somebody knows. You can't <laughs> carbon date stone and things like that, right? No. Is that why we're not able to know the precise date it was built? Well, I think in order to carbon date things, they have to ha have some kind of... Um, uh, Live matter, uh, organic... Yeah, organic uh, matter. So you can't carbon date. And so if... If it was, let's say, 12,000 years ago where there was water going through that area and that's when the erosion happened, then it had to have been built before that. Correct. But it, it wouldn't make, it's very unlikely that it was built right before that. Oh, no, no. So, You're talking about thousands of years of water erosion, thousands and thousands. So, um, absolutely. It had to be built before that. So, how so, many years before that? That's is the question. correct. That's correct. Um, it's interesting. Look, you're right. You can't date the stone, but there's one particular um, footprint. I can't tell you exactly where it is now. I want to say Anatolia, but I'm not sure. And what happened was this footprint happened in this uh, particular area where you see the impression of the foot, mm -hmm. right? And then it became petrified or whatever. But it just so happens that as this particular person was walking, they stepped on an arthropod, uh, which, which he killed as he was walking. So they stepped on this little tiny animal, right, as he was walking, and killed it and imprinted it with his footprint. And that rock is I don't know how many thousands of years old. So you can't carbon date it, but you have the structure of the arthropod, I think, you know, there, squashed into the thing and also became petrified along with this footprint. Mm. And now they're saying, but wait a minute, what on earth is going on here? And you find that the, um, like Graham Hancock says, things keep getting older and older. Things keep getting pushed back and pushed right. back. We did a, a podcast on this lady in Mexico mm -hmm. that her career was destroyed. Okay? Yeah. Um, do you happen to remember her name? Uh, her career was destroyed because she said, hey, look, this is uh, 200,000 year, 200, years old. And, um, uh, you know, she came up with, she did her write-up. It was something in Mexico. Oh, yeah. right here. And you wrote it here. She, oh, Virginia, Virginia Steen McIntyre. She came up, she wrote the article, and they took away her funding. They destroyed her life. Sheesh. And just because she told the truth, and the truth was against conventional wisdom, right? They didn't want that to happen because there's a lot of vested interest. There's a lot of books that have been written. There are a lot of egos in place that are teaching yeah. wrong history, let's say. And so 
you know, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate because we think too much of ourselves. And in the whole scope of things, we're very little, you know. And, you know, I think that as we, you know, as, as we move forward, we're going to find out more information because sure. it's harder and harder to cover it up. Before it was easier and easier. Now we're our, our global information system where if something happens in Russia, we know it here immediately. If something happens in Turkey, they'll know it in, you know, immediately at the other side of the yes. world. Yes. Um, you know, you, men you mentioned Turkey. Uh, Gobekli Tepe yes. was one of those things that when I was listening to Robert Schock, he has a great uh, presentation on it. Oh, yeah? Yeah, on um, on the Sphinx. But he ties into Gobekli Tepe because Gobekli Tepe, um, let's see, when was that discovered? Was it in the... It was a German archaeologist. In 63, name. but uh -huh. it was excavated in 95, it says. Okay. Um, Klaus Schmidt. Klaus Schmidt, he passed away. Uh, a few year, a couple of years back. Yeah, and Carol Two, Lee Claire. Claire Schmidt. Yeah, yeah, and so, um, but prior to that, I guess there, you know, this set a whole new, because um, that it says ninety five hundred to eight thousand BCE, and they had built this megalithic structure. So, like you're saying, everything keeps getting pushed back and back. Well, that's twelve thousand years ago. Yeah. Okay. And 10, so, 10,000, 10, 12,000 years ago. Yeah. Right. And, and they're, intentionally buried. Yes. So let me tell you something about that, that, you know, and as you read and read and read, it takes people, you know, like this guy from Bright Insight, uh, Jimmy. Yeah. Um, Corsetti. Corsetti and the Joe Rogans as he's having uh, Randall Carlson on his podcast and uh, Graham Hancock and, yeah. you know. And he's had uh, Robert Schock. Robert Schock, you know, these people that are trying to say, hey, guys, we don't have all the puzzles, all the pieces to this big old puzzle, but the puzzle keeps getting older and older and older. You know, we've been around for a long time. We got hit by something. Uh, it created a cataclysmic thing, and we got rebooted. We, we had to start all over again. But I'll tell you something about uh, Gobekli Tepe, uh, some people call it the smoking gun, okay? And the reason they do that is because uh, there was an archaeologist, I believe his name is Lehner, Mark Lehner, and Sahi Hawass, when, uh, when, uh, when West and Shock first talked to the world, Okay, and expose the idea that they had regarding the Sphinx. These guys got crucified. Even Shock says that I had no idea the kind of rapid fire, <laughs> the, 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 the firepower that I was going to receive. I was called everything under the sun, and yet his geologist friends agreed with him right but that voice was drowned by the ability of these people that are high power and they they're in the media um, they destroyed them and one of the things that came out in this uh, meeting of the minds that they did an open forum for the public and everything they said find us another site in the world mm -hmm. okay that's older than 4,000 years or whatever it was that they were saying that it was. Right. And at that time, there was nothing. Right. This was pre- In the nine, early Gobekli 90s. Tepe. Correct. Right. So when Gobekli Tepe was found, yeah. and it is scientifically proven fact that it's so old, that was, okay, mm -hmm. you guys wanted us to find something? Here it is. And so that, but... Yeah. It came years and years and years later. So they withstood this yeah. Oh, yeah. Fire but they've stuck with it. And that's somebody who... But uh, Robert Schock, in the presentation I was listening to... See, because megalithic structures, they're built by these huge... Uh, I guess it would be stones, rocks, right? You can't date them 
So how do they know Gebekli Tepe was that old? And one of the things that was he was talking about was that Gebekli Tepe was intentionally buried. Purposely. And it took just as much energy to bury it oh, God. as it did to build it. However, <laughs> because they buried it, there was uh, minerals in the dirt and everything that they were used to cover it that created static lights. Uh -huh. Static light. I okay. don't know how you pronounce it, but like what you have in caves. And they were able to, I guess, somehow age those. Amazing. And, and that's how they were able to figure out this thing because of the dirt that was put over it. Because it was intentionally buried. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's amazing. Because if not, maybe we wouldn't know right. how old they were. Correct. So it's, it's incredible. And you know, science is getting better and better. Yeah. Okay? So I was reading an article recently, but we got away from the Sphinx. So we're going to have to do a uh, Sphinx number two. Okay? But um, there was an article I was reading that... Um, um, so the, the, you know, the cereals that we eat today, they were trying to date back when the original cereals were... Um, You're talking about grains. Grains. The original grains. The like original ancient grains, grains, right? Yeah. And they're tracing it to Anatolia uh, in Turkey. And uh, they're going back like 10,000 years. Wow. And they are being able to... Uh, they're looking at it in a nuclear, you put it under the microscope, nuclear, whatever, and they're able to say, hey, you know what? The, these were the original grains and all kinds of other stuff. They're looking at the DNA structure of it and wow. how it changed and how it changed us as human beings. Wow. I mean, so science is getting much, much better. Yeah. And we are discovering things constantly, and the powers that be, let's say, are not able to, you know, come in and cover it up for X or Y reason. Right. And so it's being more and more exposed. And there's a lot of young people. Yeah. Like, that who's are. The, who's the other guy that was on Rogan with, uh, with um, Jimmy Cornsett? Oh, his name is Ben. Ben. Been from, I think, I Uncharted X. Okay. He's a world of knowledge. That guy also is just oh my God. extremely knowledgeable and just rapid fire. <laughs> and, and I think uh, Ben from Uncharted X has a scientific type of acuity in his mind because yeah. he was an information technologist expert. Yeah. So he's applying everything that he knew from there and he can... He's very good, uh, from what I understand, computers, and um, yeah, he's just we amazing. We need people like that. We do. Who are bringing in new ideas, and the internet has allowed those videos to get traction, and people start questioning and going themselves to go look at it, and it's really a good thing. You it know, it definitely is. And then you got people like, uh, you know, Edgar Casey, which was he was considered uh, that he could predict. Uh, uh, the things in the future and he talked about the left paw of the sphinx mm. having the records of humanity <laughs> and so for there he was called the sleeping um uh you know he predicted the future i forget what the word right now is but you know some of the stuff is a little bit out there yeah but it's very interesting how you know somehow all of it interconnects yeah you know yeah. Yeah, that area of the world is amazing. And but, so many more discoveries, like you said. Right. And, so. you know, there is a, you know, a space on the left paw of the Sphinx. Yeah, but they're not letting us get into it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Why Super not? Super cool. Why, why, why can't we, you know? But, you know, I understand they need, there's a lot of stuff. For example, you don't want to drill in there. Because you want to keep the consistency. The last thing you want to do is try to get into that space and the whole paw of the Sphinx falls apart. And, yeah. You know, so you have to uh, have do uh, it properly conservative and, measures. Yeah. Do it properly uh, and so forth and so on. Just like they did with the, that robot in the uh, shaft of the big pyramid 
you know? Mm. They created a <laughs> robot and then it, it couldn't go through because they hit another wall. They, and then years later, they came back with a more sophisticated robot. Uh, yeah. The first one was a German team. The second one, I think, was... Uh, was a um, businessman from Taiwan, I think. He, he funded the entire thing. Wow. Yeah, and, um, and, and he wanted it to get in there. And so, you know, you definitely want to uh, maintain the, the structures of everything. We sure. don't want to hurt anything, Yeah. you know. But a little hole and, you know, put a little cable through it with a camera at the end. I, is that going to destroy the integrity of... You know, the I mean, yeah, I don't know, but I I would tend to think not, and it would allow us to find out, you know, more yeah. Things. And one of the things that a lot of the people that we mentioned, including Graham and Carlson, all these guys, the fact that um, the Egyptologists and the conventional um, historians push back so much on it makes people even more inquisitive about it because people want to know their origins and if they're not buying the story you know the origins of civilization and you know like in mexico they don't know who built tejotihuacan right, right. And, and so it's even called city of the gods same thing with the pyramids in egypt and the sphinx we don't really really know who built it and so who on earth built it? Who were the gods? Who were the people that had built this prior to? Was it a civilization before the ancient Egyptians that we know, the pharaohs and all that? And, and there's mysteries everywhere. Look, um, I'll just say this and we can wrap it up. In Bolivia, there's a place called Puma Pumku. Okay? Puma Pumku is like no other place on earth. Okay, not minimizing the pyramids. There are pyramids in every continent of our world. There are pyramids all over the place. Mm -hmm. Okay, all over the place. But Puma Pumku, which I think is called the Gate of the Puma, in the translation from, uh, I forgot the the language is Kachikwa or something like that. Um, there are H blocks. Okay, that they interlock into each other. There is no other place on earth with these kind of megalithic structures. Hmm. Okay, so not to minimize the pyramids, the pyramids are all over the place, but in Bolivia, in Pumapunku, you have this megalithic, they literally look like the letter H, Mike, and they interlock <laughs> with each other. Wow. There is absolutely no other place on earth that has anything like this. Wow. Okay? And um, it is a huge mystery. Yeah. Okay? Puma Bunku. It's uh, near Lake Tikticaca in, uh, in Bolivia. And so um, it, it be, it's, it's a part of a, 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 another. It's Puma Bunku and... So Pumapunku is part of a major uh, uh, thing called, Ti I think, Tijuanaco. Um, but Pumapunku has H blocks that no other place on earth um, can boast of that. No other place. And that's a huge mystery. And why? And how? And some of them are have radiation. They're, they're magnetized. Or, you know, I mean. So there are mysteries everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you'll... It'll take a lifetime <laughs> and 10 more, you know, to figure it out. But we got to keep trying. We got to keep trying. And in the meantime, have some fun with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing yeah. everything you know about the, the Sphinx bit. and just a little bit and a few other uh, mysterious places around the world. Okay. Thank you.